when I realize the congregation is with me, we're worshiping together, and everything is hitting, all the connect points are there. So those were highlights. You felt like the congregation was being family together, then that was a highlight for me. I always enjoyed that tremendously. First time ever standing at a pulpit preaching a sermon was to two churches as their pastor. So I was as green as they go, and my churches were extremely supportive, and they nurtured me, and they laughed with me when I made really, really dumb mistakes. They didn't beat me up. They just said, you know, the one thing some of the people said is we train them up and send them out, and that's they felt that that was their ministry, and they did a great job with that too. While I was in ministry, I lost my wife to cancer, and I was with her. She was only sick for five months and then died. And she was a school teacher and, and a great pastor's wife. And well, and I also wanted to say a word of appreciation to the churches for accepting and encouraging me to remarry. I remember I was at a Board of Stewards meeting at first in Lancaster, and they were, I was telling them everything going on, and they knew that I was dating Renee, uh, who is now my wife but they did not know that we were getting very, very serious. So at the end of the meeting, I announced that I was getting remarried and they, my wife, my late wife had died while I was there. And then they get, got to see this transition and they were super supportive and very, very, very happy for me. Uh, then after I got ready to leave that church, when, you know, got pointed to another church, they told me the same thing they'd always said about my late wife. They said, well, you can go, but Renee has to stay. And so that's been the case. And she's always done a great job as a pastor's wife. And that means a lot to me. But the support of the people, understanding that transitions happen and that that's a part of life, part of death, and part of life that you continue on with the journey. I have been blessed to be in such a unique position to serve the church at the local level, but also at the general agency level. Just an opportunity I never would have thought. I never would have thought they would hire me to work at a general agency, especially my favorite general agency, which was the General Board of Church and Society. Leslie talked about the world as my parish. I literally, in this position, got to see the world as my parish with Methodists from Africa to Russia to Philippines to Eastern Europe. So many times we've traveled to these places and and throughout the United States, so the world was indeed uh, my parish. <laughs> One event we had was a church from um, St. Louis, Missouri, Manchester United Methodist Church sent their choir to Washington, D.C. And I got to host them. We probably had 60 people in our rotunda. And I was showing them the Bible passages. Uh, one passage is Micah 6, 8. It says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and walk humbly with your God? I would always ask them, what does justice mean to you? One of the young women said, justice means making the world look the way Jesus would want it to look if he was here. I just love that. It was like a light came on because it was putting justice in a new light. It wasn't a negative, but it was from a positive standpoint. It's about trying to uh, make the world right, bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's like setting things straight. And think as we make justice decisions, we can think about what would Jesus do? What would he want the world to look like if he was here and working through us? Which is true. He is here. Christ is working through us. And we can help make a better and just world. Some of the most memorable things are going to be things you didn't expect. You know, having been working in a you know, secular field for a number of years, I was known as a, you know, a minister and officiated a wedding for one of my co-workers and actually did a couple of funerals, um, including a funeral for an atheist you know, colleague. I had done a funeral for his, for his mother, um, who actually had been baptized as a child but was not active in the church. And uh, you know, when, a few years later, when he was diagnosed with cancer and, decided, and you know, was facing death, you know, he said, I'd like for you to do, do my funeral. He said, yeah, I know <laughs> we don't have the same you know, ideas about, you know, about God and all that, but you know, but I appreciated what you did you know, with, you know, with my mother's service. And you know. so you never know, what's, you know what kind of things like that are going to happen. 
Um, but just to be open to, you know, to unexpected opportunities. And there are plenty of things that I could have done that, you know, I let pass by, but I have really appreciated the ones that I didn't let pass by and, and took advantage of. And I think we need to you know, be open to the fact that, that our understandings are going to change and there are going to be a whole lot of people with very different ideas that are all part of the family of God. If we can figure out how to, how to gather at the same table without um, you know, acting like the, you know, the kids poking each other under the table at grandma's, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, try to behave and get along. Um, we're not all going to agree, but you know, we can live together and love each other and maybe not, not worry so much about you know, some things that we think are really important, but may not be the critical things. Maybe we need, you know, need to be a little more willing to let go of some things, try some things that are new. Um, there's some good stuff that we don't want to get rid of, but we can, you know, not, we can do the good things, but maybe in a, in a new way. For the 1995 Vacation Bible School materials, the theme was Turn About Paul. I was the most rabbinical looking person in Nashville who worked cheap for free because I was at the publishing house and the Vacation Bible School unit was part of the publishing house. So I was the model. And I, I was on every teacher book cover, every class pack cover, every craft kit, and they even did a caricature of me as Paul. Later that summer, the summer of 95, I made a few personal appearances as the Apostle Paul. I was at a one church and the children who were all four, five, six years old were coming up to me. They didn't understand how I could be so old to have lived in the time of Jesus and to be here today. That was just fun stuff. When I worked for the Upper Room, I got to fly all over the world. And one of my trips to South Africa, I went on a Sunday to a, an ordinary Methodist church in Soweto. The pastor announces that I'm there. In fact, he pronounced my name correctly. And we want the first mother of South Africa to bring greetings. Well, I heard first lady. I thought, well, that's nice. The pastor's wife is going to say something to me. And out of the congregation comes Winnie Mandela, the first mother of South Africa. And she gives me the handshake, the hug, the kiss. And we talked a while. And she was an ordinary member of that congregation. That same day, I went to uh, visit a family in Soweto. Their son was in prison on drug charges. I prayed with them. They prayed with me. That was a big day. I, I enjoyed publishing tremendously. One of the wonders of the pandemic is that uh, we're getting a chance to try things new. And we're experimenting. We're finding out some things work, some things don't. You know? And God is in our midst at work. So what, what more do we need? I'd like to express my thanks for the opportunity to serve in the life of the church. I've had a variety of experiences that have been very meaningful to me and will always be. I began in pastoral ministry, but I also had an opportunity to serve uh, through the general boards and agencies of the church, the United Methodist Publishing House, and the development of curriculum. I've also had the opportunity to serve with the General Commission on Christian Unity and Interreligious Concerns. I've visited uh, Africa University. I would remind persons who are beginning ministry to uh, make sure that they establish a prayer life and that they are faithful in serving uh, the church. I also would remind persons to uh, gather as many opportunities to know as many people from different racial ethnic groups that are a part of the church as well, to gain different kinds of perspectives, and to be mindful even when we have differences, that rather than stepping aside, that we seek to understand uh, one another better. My hope and my prayer is that in the time to come, 
we will do much more in terms of having congregations that more fully reflect the life of the church. It is easy to say we are the children of God. I am calling on the church to actually be the church of God and to do things much differently than we have done before. While we are bearing witness to God's church, there are others looking on, uh, seeing what we do and what we don't do. And I'm just asking us to be honest about who we are and to be faithful as the church of God. And I believe that that's God's call to each and every one of us. I love to preach. I love to preach, not for any personal aggrandizement, but for what I deem to be the intended purpose of preaching, and that is to present Christ to the people. In one of my appointments, I had two congregations, and they worked together, but not as close as I thought they should or could work together. And before leaving, God bless that we had 53 members from the combined churches, 53 young people in confirmation class, 53. I can't get above that, I guess, for I think what, uh, what we are called to do and, as ministers, and that is to begin with the people as young as you can and stay with the people as long as you can. I had a professor in Atlanta that said to me, uh, Mac, one day you will learn that God doesn't need you to help him save the world. He invites you to help him save the world. He is well able to do that by himself. I said to the congregation just prior to retiring, on that last Sunday that I preached at parking lot service, that it was amazing to me that God saw fit to take us out beyond the walls of the church and literally place us in the community that we were in physically, but to let us know that the church is beyond these walls, not just for that particular church, for churches, for the conference, for United Methodism, for any denomination. The church belongs to God, and it is to serve the people. One of the things that I have been just so blessed by by being in ministry has been the relationships that I've made over the years, over 42 years of moving all over the state of South Carolina, um, serving in different churches, been able to meet and love a lot of people and be loved back and returned by them. And uh, that has just enriched my life, enriched my family's life to know in. A lot of ministry is about relationship. And uh, that's been one of the joys is building those relationships over the years. Find that mentor find that close friend, find that person that you can share your life, your frustrations, your call, uh, what's going on, your needs, just that you can share anything with and that they will share that with you as well. That, that will keep you going in ministry, I think. I am just grateful that the United Methodist Church gave me the opportunity to answer my call to ordain ministry and supported me in it. The bishops, the district superintendents, our colleagues, the support that I've, I've had in ministry, the, the, the ability to answer that call in a variety of settings is just, it's just been tremendous. And I am extremely grateful to the United Methodist Church. I wanna, I wanna say a word of thank you to my wife because quite honestly, I don't know that I would have made it through this without her. She was there every day, every step of the way, in the good times, sharing the joy and the excitement, and in the bad times, um, there to support me, to lift me up. Life, ministry would have been totally different without her. 
and I am so thankful that that she has been with me throughout this process. I had retina surgery back in 2001, 2002. Cataracts and then retina surgery. I was extremely nearsighted. I couldn't get in the Army, couldn't get in the Marines, couldn't get in the Navy, the Air Force. They didn't want me. So I was uh, one of these uh, 4F people after college. And um, the uh, surgery caused uh, for the cataracts caused my retina to detach in my left eye, and then that was repaired. And then the retina detached to my right eye, and that was repaired, and then the de uh, retina detached again in my right eye. So I spent a lot of time in the hospital for healing. Um, and I laid there with both eyes covered, and I made a deal with God and said, Lord, if you will give me enough sight to function, I will go out and spread your word. And after uh, they took the bandages off and I could see, the opportunity arose to uh, get into lay speaking. Uh, started into lay servant ministry. And uh, uh, my wife basically told me, this is your chance. And I thought to myself, I wrote a check. And I have to make sure that God can cash that check. So I started uh, in the lay speaking and then uh, moved on into local pastorship. But that's the story of how I really got into this. I was laying there in bed, completely blind, and I made a deal. And for some odd reason, God heard me. <laughs> Look to the Lord, because he's there in the pulpit with you. Uh, that is really hallowed ground. Being sacramental in people's lives, and what I mean by that is uh, being able to bring grace to them. You know, whether that, be, whether that be a baptism or a wedding, or even when so, at the point of death and, and family, be able to show sacramental grace toward people and how, how God isn't, is in fact a part of their lives and each and every day but in those special times if you want to call them special um to be able to be there for them and and to to be like i said i think the best way to describe it is sacramental so i can't give you a specific instances but i've had many of those type of situations in in my ministry there's going to be times when ministry is going to get tough there's going to be times when you're going to have to deal with difficult people. Yes, even in the church, you're going to have to deal with difficult people. There's going to be times where you're going to want to quit and just say, I'm done. But you can't do that if you remember your calling. Your calling, this is not a career. It's, it's not a job. It's calling. And you've, you, as long as you can always remember that, I think that goes a long ways because I, I would probably not find myself alone with dealing with those feelings of there were times in the 25 years that, that I wanted to quit and uh, couldn't because the calling kept me going. I'm actually a retired Navy senior chief, and uh, so I was second vocation. So thank you for the opportunity of letting this sailor become a part of, of annual conference and uh, give me a different perspective on life uh, thank you for all those opportunities. Thank you for the folks in the churches that I've served down through the years. And thank you that I was given the opportunity to be sacramental in their lives. One of the single greatest highlights for me has been to be a member of the United Methodist Church Clergy Connection. I think the clergy connection that we have is one of the single greatest gatherings and collections of diverse people that the world has ever seen. It is a, a strong part of our denomination and I think it is just tremendous. That's the highlight for me. The best advice that I could give to somebody just starting the ministry is to take care of yourself, physically, emotionally, psychologically, but most especially spiritually. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the people who are hurting, who are broken,
who need you, and that includes your family. So keep a strong relationship between yourself and Jesus and within your family. And, and don't be afraid to take a Sabbath. I love the United Methodist Church. I did not grow up as, as a Methodist. I was raised as a Presbyterian. I'm a United Methodist by choice. And I think it is, the way that it is set up is the best uh, way for making disciples. I love John Wesley. I love the basic emphasis that we have within the United Methodist Church. And, and I'm, I'm just so glad to have been able to be a part of it all these years. One thing that I would like to say is I think the South Carolina United Methodist Church Annual Conference is one of the best annual conferences in the world. I've, I came from Ohio, so I've got a comparison, and I just think South Carolina is just tremendous. The, the camaraderie that we have, uh, the uh, Episcopal leadership that we've had while I've been here is just tremendous. And we have uh, a, a really great uh, opportunity here in South Carolina. I, I see great days ahead for the United Methodist Church. I really do.